Father, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would bless your word. I pray that tonight just wouldn't be a pursuit of knowledge. Uh, Lord, I, I know that I and, and all of these young men and women who have gathered here tonight, we, if we want to hear something straight from your throne room. We want to hear a word from you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would come and that he would set these pages um, ablaze. Lord, I pray that it would be these words, um, these truths, that they would come through in all of the all of the weight of your glory, all of the, the power of your spirit, Lord. Um, Lord, we need, we need you to come through tonight and to um, open up your word to us. So in that spirit, Lord, I, I give this time to you and I ask um, for your blessing upon your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And when a great multitude had gathered and others had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground and sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear let him hear. So I want to I want to say this that one of the main keys to understanding this parable is actually verse 4. He's looking at this huge multitude of people that has come out, some of them sincere, some of them maybe a little less than sincere. Um, according to the parable, it seems that somewhere in the realm of 3 out of 4 of them were insincere, though it's probably not proportional. Um uh, to the the he probably doesn't mean three out of four, but there is a good portion of these people, um, this large multitude that's come out to him, who maybe he, the things he's going to say aren't going to to um, to take root. Interesting that he ends the parable this parable by saying, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." Um. I remember reading a story of a man and a friend of his who was an Indian. They had become friends many years before, but um, this man who was an Indian was in town, and so they got together and and they were going, um, they were walking through the city where he lived to um, this restaurant to go have dinner together, and they were having a conversation when the Indian, um, in the midst of all the hustle and bustle of the city, heard something and stopped and and walked over to a a tree a, a planter full of flowers and some bushes and a tree and and stopped and pulled apart some some bushes and found a cricket and pulled the cricket out and made some comment about the cricket and the guy was like his friend was like how did you even hear that i didn't even i didn't even know that was there i didn't even hear it above the hustle and bustle and 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 his friend this this indian man said Watch this. And he pulled out of his pocket some change and dropped the change there on the, the sidewalk there on the city. And every head for a hundred yards turned and looked. And he said, it, it really depends on what you're tuned into. And it made a really good point. And that story always stuck with me. That, And I believe it's part of what's going on here with when Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So often people don't have ears to hear what God is saying because they're tuned into something else. And that's going to kind of come into play as we, we dive into what the parable means. So verses 9 through 10, Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. <laughs> trippy <laughs> man there are some debates about this verse i'll tell you what what in the world is he saying because it sounds like jesus is saying that he's speaking in parables and most bible teachers will skim over this verse and say oh he's speaking in parables to make the truths more clear really that's not what he said he he didn't say that at all he doesn't say it anywhere in any of the versions of this parable it's that's not said. He doesn't say, "Oh, I'm using parables because you you all are farmers, and I it'll be make it easier for you to understand." No, he says explicitly, quoting the Old Testament, "I'm speaking in parables so that they won't understand." Let's just be really clear. That's what it's saying. 
If you can make it say something else, I want to hire you as my lawyer. Because it does not say anything else. It could not be any more clear. It, it's... Mm. He literally is saying, I'm speaking in parables so they won't understand. Trippy. So why does God speak in parables? Why does he use mysteries? Why does he use mysteries? Why does he speak in parables? I have three reasons that I find in Scripture for why he speaks in parables or why he uses mysteries. Why he makes things hard to understand. He has his reasons. And the first key to understanding this is letting the what he what he explicitly said be what it is. He speaks in parables so it's harder to understand. <clears throat> so, three reasons. First reason is they make a distinction. Second reason is they make a doxology. And third reason is that they make a disciple. They make a distinction, firstly, between selfish seekers and sincere seekers. Jesus said, do you think that I came to bring peace? No, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. That's trippy. He said, from now on, father will be against son, and son will be against sister-in-law, and son-in-law will be against mother. In, in one house, they will be divided. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Now, the proclamation of his coming, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, it really should be translated, as Malcolm has detailed in the Greek, um, it really should be translated, peace on earth towards men of goodwill. That's what that should say. He did come to bring peace on earth towards men of goodwill. But he said very clear, clearly later in his ministry, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Hear me on this, guys. This is a fundamental truth about spiritual life that if you don't get down, you will have a hard time understanding what God is doing in many situations throughout, li throughout your life. God, one of the primary things Jesus did and we do when we share the gospel is we make a distinction. We make a distinction between the wheat and the tares. Jesus came and one of his primary focuses was not just getting the gospel out there simply for the sake of people getting saved. Yes, that is his primary reason. But there is this other thing that God is doing. He is actively making a distinction in the world through hard times, through difficult circumstances that are hard to understand, through things that people don't understand. They make a distinction between the selfish seeker and the sincere believer or the sincere seeker. You see, the person who actually has been, everyone has been touched by the Holy Spirit, but the person who has been responding to it and is beginning to see God's goodness and to fall in love with God is going to push through the hard times, is going to push through the misunderstandings, is going to push through the mysteries in their life, and they are going to keep seeking Him. The selfish seeker, the person who is seeking God, but for their own benefit, for their own glory, for their own comfort, for their own advancements, that person is only going to seek so far through so much difficulty. And then they're going to turn back and say, this has gotten too difficult. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do this. And so a lot of what is happening in your friend's lives when some really hard thing blows through a family member's life or a friend's life, and you're beginning to go, God, I've been praying for this person for a long time. I don't understand why you haven't come through yet. Can I tell you that circumstance, probably 80% of why that comes about that way and why you don't ever see God actually act in that scenario is because he's making a distinction. You see, he sees in that person's heart that there's actually no love for him. He sees in that person's heart that there is actually an intense self-centeredness. Like Cain. Cain actually brought God worship, right? He actually was more proactive than the, the real worshiper who came in faith. He came first. He came with something that was more effort. And you say, well, I don't understand. Why doesn't God, why doesn't God just make it easier for people to come to him? Do you know why? It's because then the church will be filled with canes. It would be filled with wolves in sheep's clothing. Murderers. Think about the fact that Cain was coming to God. He was coming to the right God. He was coming through incredible efforts. 
but he was coming because he loved himself, not because he loved God. And at first you're like, maybe that's not that big of a deal. Let me tell you why it's a big deal. Because when a person is doing religious things because they love themselves, they're capable of anything. As soon as self is wounded, they become murderous. Just like Cain did. That's why God makes a distinction. How horrible would it be? And actually, there are some churches like this where God's not even really allowed in the church door. And because he's not allowed in the church door and, and the things he does aren't allowed there, there, there aren't really a lot of distinctions made. And you have churches where half the members of the church are wolves. How does that go? Or three quarters of the people. That's why, like this group, at times you can maybe even look at this group and be like, man, it'd be nicer if there were 200 people here. Maybe Chris should ease up on some things or, or not be so sharp about making distinctions. And I've got to tell you that I'm not sure that, that getting a bunch more warm bodies in the church by, by easing up and going gentler on the scriptures and maybe not being so watchful over the flock so that we can fill the flock with wolves is a great idea. But I tell you guys the truth. I don't know if you are in a season or you've ever been in a season where you looked at a family member and something mysterious that was happening in their life, really difficult, something you couldn't understand, something they couldn't understand, and you prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for God to come through, and he hasn't done that miraculous thing, that miraculous deliverance, or or spoken in the way you thought he should. It's probably because he knows their heart, and he's making a distinction. And it would be best if it's been going on for years and God hasn't touched that person or moved on their behalf to admit that maybe it's because God knows and does what's right and he knows what's in their heart and quit judging him for what he has or hasn't done in their life because he's making a distinction. So the first reason that he does mysterious, speaks mysteriously sometimes, makes things hard to understand intentionally is because it makes a distinction between real believers and fake ones. Mm. Secondly, it makes a doxology. Now this is based, the second and third points are based off, Ma- sorry Matthew, Proverbs 25.2, which says it is the glory of kings to conceal a matter. Sorry, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the glory of kings to search a matter out. Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the glory of kings to search a matter out. We find our next two points from that verse. The first being that those mysteries, those parables, those things that God does and says that are he does intentionally to make it harder to understand, he does to make a doxology. And I don't mean that in the generic um, common English version of what the word means now. I mean it in the literal Greek meaning of the word, and that is doxa in Greek is the word for glory. It could also mean opinion in the, the sort of generic Greek, but in the, the scriptural Greek, doxa is the word that's chosen to be translated from the Hebrew word kabod for glory. Interestingly enough, they both also can mean weight, um, weightiness, because glory has that concept to it, but doxology being glory and the study of, that idea there that it makes this aspect of who God is, the study of glory, the study, something to study, to study God's glory. He makes it difficult. And let me say it this way. These truths are so beautiful and valuable, the truths that we study in the Gospels here that reveal the very heart of God, these truths are so beautiful and valuable, their full weight can only be understood by the difficulty and the journey to achieve them. I remember reading a story about a 16-year-old, and he lived in Orlando, and his parents were so wealthy they bought him a Ferrari, a brand new Ferrari for his 16th birthday. And he promptly wrecked it. I believe it was Orlando. In downtown Orlando, he wrecked it into a building within a couple weeks. And I have to think about how crazy it was that they bought him this car that he didn't appreciate how valuable the car was. That he drove it like a maniac and was doing somewhere in the realm of six or seven times the speed limit when he wrecked it. Because he was being a maniac and he didn't appreciate the value of the car. 
And you can contrast that with the man who, instead of being born into a fortune, works his entire life and at his 66th birthday, has saved up money his entire life and buys a brand new Ferrari. Can I tell you, he's probably not going to go wreck it into a building. Probably not. He might. We all have that inner child. (laughs) I would find it hard not to drive it really fast. But I want to tell you, it's not hard for us to imagine, though, that that man, having a full understanding of the car's value because he saved a lifetime for it, is probably not going to go wreck it. Statistically speaking, we know this. The insurance company would charge him far less money for the car. That The kid, I remember reading, it was his parents were paying somewhere in the realm of $3,500 to $5,000 a month in insurance. You think your insurance is expensive. They're like, dude, he's going to wreck it within a year. $5,000 a month, you know? But here's this truth. If you're following what I'm saying, the reason that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, this idea of him creating a doxology, something for us to study, something for us to pursue, is that the only way for him to make truths that are readily available, have their full weight to you, and have the impact in your life that you understand how valuable they are, is to conceal them in such a way that you have to search diligently and search, and search, and search. And so I have to tell you guys, I've had, this is just the honest truth, whatever. I've had a number of young men ask me in the last year, um, a handful at least, to disciple them. And those of you who have asked, some of you might be in this room, you're probably like, why is he not doing anything? I'm struggling. I'm struggling, honestly. I'm struggling with how to do it. I I used to disciple people, but if I'm honest with you, the reason I'm struggling and I'm trying to pray through how to do it is this very issue. I'm struggling with whether it's healthy or not for a spiritual leader to just drop heavy truth bombs on people because it's easy to do. It's impressive, right? It makes you go, whoa, he's weighty. No, he just read that in the book. He's not weighty. Some of the truths I share with you guys from time to time that are weighty and they have that sort of truth bomb effect, it was decades of pain and searching and heartache that, that gave them their full weight in my life. It was searching and reading books and coming across books and wading through books that weren't so good and books that were good and until you come across these books that are amazing. And if I'm honest with you, I'm not totally sure Because I didn't read Fenelon's book until I'd been a Christian for 16 or 17 years. And by the time I came across The Seeking Heart and I'm reading that book, I'm like, dude, where have you been all my life? These truths are what I've needed. But because it took so much searching and there was so much effort involved, it had a different sort of weight to me than if I just run a sort of a discipleship program where as soon as someone gets saved, I drop the 12 heaviest books of my life in their lap. Is that making sense to you guys? I'm I'm literally struggling with that, with that truth. I've been struggling with it, with the idea of I'm not entirely sure that it's healthy for believers, for their spiritual leaders to just drop truth bomb after truth bomb of things that you have earned that understanding only at heavy cost and through much time and effort and wading through a lot of useless stuff. I'm not sure it has the same weight. I'm not sure it has the same impact. I'm not sure that it's, and it's not that I'm saying it like, oh, you won't value it, so I'm not going to do it. It's that I'm, I actually think it's not healthy. I think that the truths, the truths themselves le- lose their value. And so I'm struggling. I'm struggling in that sense. How do you actually... Because, you know, I ran a sort of a discipleship. It wasn't a program, but it was sort of. it for well, After I graduated Bible college for about eight or nine years, I, just, I was always discipling two or three or four or five guys at a time. And I had to come to grips with the fact that a good portion of them walked away from the Lord. And I had to, I had to, I had to look back at it, and I think that this wasn't the primary reason, but one of the reasons that happened is because... It was so, it felt so good in my youth to drop, oh man, I learned this in Bible college. This is really going to blow their minds. Bam! You know, next Wednesday night we meet at Barnes & Noble. Here's another one. Bam! You know, aren't I great? 
And you know what I found though is that I think that that was one of the dynamics that that led to an unhealthiness in those guys. Really, they they there was there was a, an endemic lack of appreciation. There beca- there grew an endemic lack of appreciation for the weighty truths of Scripture. And I look back and I go, why didn't you give the same amount of weight that I gave to this truth? Why did it? Because it was so easily given to them. It didn't take them seven years of searching to come across this truth. They weren't given this truth from James chapter 2 that, that kept me from shipwrecking the faith with tears streaming down my face as I pressed play on my MP3 player saying, I don't really want to follow you anymore, Lord. And I press play and the next teaching plays through and it's this truth that actually makes everything in my Christian life make sense. But it, it was only earned through years of, honestly, years of heartache and searching. I really genuinely believe that this is, a, this is an important truth here for us, for believers. Because I'm telling you, from a pastor's perspective, it's probably my greatest temptation it's probably my greatest temptation. When I'm preparing teachings, one of the hardest things for me to do is to remove illustrations. Oh, this is one of my favorite illustrations. This makes some truth really ele- relevant. And God goes, that's not where we're going tonight. It's not about you impressing people with your great illustrations. That's a temptation almost every time I prepare a teaching is to fill it with a bunch of really impressive stuff that actually would be unhealthy for you. Anyways, be that as it may. It makes a doxology. It gives us a pursuit for our lives in the study of God's glory. Thirdly, they make disciples. <laughs> so after that heavy truth, let's use something cliche. <laughs> you all, I'm certainly, have heard the story of the, the, the old lady and the butterfly or the old dude and the butterfly. There are like 30 versions of this on the internet. Who knows if it's true? The story itself, it's probably true because there are about a lot of myth-busting stuff on the internet about this story. And there are apparently butterflies, not all butterflies, but some butterflies, if you help them out of their cocoon, they will die. And so you guys probably know that story about the, the old lady. She had the little butter, the, the, the caterpillar, and then she watched it, or the little girl, and she watched it turn into the chrysalis or whatever in the cocoon. And, and then one day she saw it struggling, or he saw it struggling to get out of the cocoon, and it just went on and on and on and hour after hour. And finally it's like, uh, I don't think it's going to make it. And so she went and got her sewing scissors and cut the cocoon so the butterfly could come out. And then the butterfly just hung there, fat and plump with limp wings, and died the next day. You guys have probably heard that story, right? Okay, some of you haven't. Okay, not cliche. Truth bomb, yeah. Um, (laughs) Here's the truth. The truth is apparently that with a lot of butterflies, the act of breaking out of the cocoon is actually what um, forces the juices to expand into into their wings, into whatever, they're not veins, whatever, they're little wing function and there are a lot of butterflies if they are helped out of their cocoon they will never fly and they'll die because it's literally the struggle of working themselves out of their cocoon that forces all of the juices from their body out into their wings and actually helps their wings grow to maturity and this is apparently true of some butterflies probably not it apparently not all the analogy is 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 obvious right one of the reasons that God makes things difficult to understand, that he hides truth, that he speaks in parables to the mass of people, that so many people, he actually makes it hard to understand, is because it's the path, as I've already kind of bled into this truth, it's that seeking of the truth, it's that 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 hero's path that turns us into a disciple. It's not the truth itself. And please hear me on this. This is This is true truth right here. Understanding doesn't make you a disciple. Overcoming does. Devotion does. Not understanding. And there's a, misunder- there's a misunderstanding that if I just had more Bible knowledge, I would be more mature. And they're not the same thing at all. You, you can actually be relatively low on Bible knowledge, but if, you're, if you have this, a, a good level of Bible knowledge and a good level of experience and they match each other, you can find yourself actually in a, in a really good degree of maturity. 
But it's the process so often, it's the struggle so often that is actually turning you into a disciple, not the knowledge you're gaining. Be careful of that. Be careful of that, guys. Moving on. So let me ask you another question based on these verses right here. Who gets to understand? Who gets to understand then? Three more points. These are much quicker than the last, I promise you. The committed. The committed get to understand. His disciples, the ones who are committed to him, the ones who are devoted to him, these are the people that got to understand. It's just... It's just there. The people who are committed are the ones who gain the understanding. Coupled with that, the way those in Koinonia also get the understanding. You guys know Koinonia is the Greek word for that's translated in your New Testament and your English as fellowship. In the Greek, koine it, may, it meant to have in common. Koinonia meant to have all to have in common, and that's why they had their. It's where where it's a very picturesque version of what it meant to have fellowship. It didn't just mean to have sweet conversation, though that's part of it. The idea had two parts, that you had Jesus in common, but it had a much more practical and less popular 21st century meaning, and that is that they physically had all things in common. The reason it came became so popular with the first century church is because they literally were living communally, at least in, in the Jerusalem area they were, and they literally did share all things. They literally did sell all their possessions and put all the money in a, in a pile, and they did literally have all things in common. So it had two primary meanings. It meant that we as believers, if we have nothing else in common, we have one thing, we are our love for Jesus and our, our mutual salvation through his atonement on the cross. But the second meaning, which <clears throat> really was the other reason it became so popular among first century Christians, is because they did basically have all things in common. They sold everything. But so this this idea that they were in fellowship, they were there. You guys know this. Those, those of you who have been traveling with me through the scriptures know that one of the most important truths that I harp on on a regular basis, I, I, I would call it, if I had five teachings left to, left to give you, it would be one of the five. Would be you must stay in fellowship. And I apologize for those of you who have heard this teaching before, but maybe it's a good reminder. I know people that have broken fellowship even with this group even recently and aren't here and should be here because they've forgotten this truth. You must stay in fellowship. If it's not here, please go to mezzanine or go somewhere and get the word. Worst thing you can do, though, is just stop going to church. Be like, oh, I can hear church online. That's not the same thing. That is not the same thing. You can get a lot of things wrong in your Christian life, and you'll be okay if you're still in fellowship. You can get doctrine wrong, but if you're in fellowship, you'll eventually be in a teaching one day and you're going to get cor- that that wrong doctrine is going to get corrected. You can have some sort of defect in your spiritual life, but if you stay in fellowship, the love of the brothers and the sisters in the fellowship is going to uphold you and some teaching, some point or some book somebody recommends, God's going to minister to you through that. But if you get fellowship wrong, if you stop hanging out under the spout where the blessings come out, If you stop doing that, if you stop meeting with God's people and being where they are, everything else will unravel. I promise you that. I didn't make that up, by the way. Thirdly, the questioners get the understanding. So those in Koinonia, uh, that, that was based off the premise here that the disciples didn't need to come to Jesus and ask him. They were with Jesus. And so they were... These three work together. The people who are committed and are in fellowship and ask the questions get the understanding. Those three things. You can't really take one without the other two as far as this goes. To having godly understanding and getting the deeper understandings about life. The committed who are in fellowship who ask God questions and not in a sort of accusatory way like Simon did or or in a judgmental way. But the people who come to God and ask. James says you have not because you ask not. God makes it really clear. He's not, he has no problem with people asking him questions. If, now, if the questions are asked spitefully or in a lack of faith, that's a whole other thing. But he, he actually invites questions. There are places in Scripture where he invites questions. And he says, ask me. Ask me. I want to fill, I'll fill, you, I'll fill your mouth. Open your mouth wide and ask me. 
the questioners get to understand. So moving on, verse 11, we're going to finish these points real quickly. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. And because of this verse 11, I have to tell you that for many, 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 many years, I thought that this parable was about the word of God. It's not. Because of verse 11, you can get the misconception that the parable is about the word of God, and it's really not. If you read the parable over and over again, you will quickly come to the conclusion that the word of God is about the only static thing in the parable, actually. In that, I mean the only thing that's not changing. It's the same in all four circumstances. The word of God is the word of God. Let's just be really clear about that. I'm not downplaying the word of God's importance in a person's life, but it's not what this parable is about. I think you'll agree with me if you med- if you spend some time in it and meditate on it. Now this <clears throat> now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. So there are four four soils obviously the four soils if you read the parable over and over again the soil is analogous to your heart condition okay so there are four heart conditions they are the wayside the rocky soil the the soil among thorns and good soil so the wayside rocky soil among thorns and good soil here firstly in 11 through 12 we see this the uh, seed was sown in this I, I smile when I read this because I think about how sloppy this sower was. That he's just like, whew, like, and I think we're supposed to be sloppy in how we share the gospel, right? We are. There is this embedded truth here that the gospel is like a dragnet. We're just supposed to throw it out, and we're not supposed to be discriminatory about it. I think there's a lot of discrimination, um, and I don't mean that in the modern political media usage of it, but I think there's too much discrimination in the sharing of the gospel in the church today. And maybe it is actually based on race in some circumstances, but there's a lot of discrimination in the sharing of the gospel. There is this kind of obvious truth here in this parable that this guy's like throwing seed everywhere. I don't know where he was. He got some in the field, in the good field. He got some in a bad field. He got some in like an open field and he got some in the road. (laughs) He's throwing it all over. Anyways, I think that's funny. Um, (laughs) And I think it's also valuable. Those are the wayside, or the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The noteworthy aspect of this soil is its location. The other two bad soils, the location is not the noteworthy aspect about them. In the rocky soil, you're going to notice it's the condition of the soil is the noteworthy aspect. And in the soil among thorns, you're going to notice that it's entanglements or the noteworthy aspect. But the noteworthy aspect of this soil is its location. These hearts, this soil is representative of the person's heart who is in the well-trafficked paths of the world. You can imagine there are these pathways next to these fields. And where people walk all the time, the soil gets compacted and there's no way... And heck, a, a seed could take root in the middle of compacted soil. I don't know if you've ever read, I, I came across an article at some point, I only read part of it about the importance of ants in the world, but if ants didn't exist, the world wouldn't exist. And it's an interesting argument because they made the point that ants actually uncompact the soil so that vegetation can grow. And that if it wasn't for ants and the other insects that actually burrow and dig holes, that the soil on the planet in, a, in a, whatever, a couple thousand years would become so dense and compact that nothing could grow and everything would eventually die. Water wouldn't even penetrate down. Because you know how like our sand out here, if you pour water on the sand, it rolls off it. It doesn't really penetrate the sand. <clears throat> Interesting, soil would actually become so compact, though that's a different reason with the sand, that's probably a bad illustration, but soil would actually become so compact that vegetation couldn't couldn't grow. And the wayside is like that, it it just gets trampled down, it's where everybody's traveling and there are people's hearts, there are people who that's really the condition of their heart, because they're always at the well-trafficked water holes, the well-trafficked paths of the world's they can never really receive the word of God when it's sown into their lives. It just, it's like it bounces off. 
and the devil just comes and steals it because they, their hearts are so compacted, so hard, honestly, because of all of the, the, the their, their, they sit day in and day out in front of the TV and watch the most horrible, profane things. And they, they go to work and they, they, they hang out with the people at the water cooler and say and entertain jokes. And they, they go to the bar every Thursday night. And, and they're in all of these places, all the well-trafficked places of the world. Let me tell you, I personally believe the, the, the primary implication of this, thing, this, this truth, the wayside, the thing that's noteworthy about it is, is, is it is its location. <clears throat> Secondly, the, the rocky soil, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. The noteworthy thing is already mentioned about this one is, it's, is the condition of the soil. Just like a person's heart, rocky can be rocky, and it can be hard for God's word to take root in a person's heart whose heart has grown hard. Now, I could challenge you to do this, but if you start looking up all the places in the Bible where it refers to someone hardening their heart, um, as far as all the ones I looked up, they all had one common theme. There's one way you harden your heart. I think of Pharaoh. I think of Pharaoh hearing God's word through Moses and him deciding that he wasn't going to obey God's word. Um, I think of Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, where it's quoting Psalm 95, and it says... Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the day, as in the day of rebellion. Speaking of Kadesh Barnea in Exodus, but that word, that, that verse, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your heart. And all the places in scripture where I could find where it talks about hard hearts, it's always in conjunction with hearing God's word and ignoring it. And the rocky soil, and I'll, I'll give my argument, part of the things I'm saying, the whole understanding, whatever, what I'm saying will make more sense when I finish the parable and we talk about the whole parable as a whole. I think it's important to note, well, let me just keep moving. So verse 14, and the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go and go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Another interesting study is to is to is to look up how many times pleasure and care are linked in the scriptures because they're linked a lot. For those of you, maybe there are people in here tonight that are getting really tempted to leave fellowship or to kind of stop being so committed to the Lord because you want to go live in the pleasures of this world. Can I tell you that the cares of this life come part and parcel with the pleasures? That's been my experience unequivocally. One of the greatest hindrances to me walking away from the Lord in the early years is I just thought about high school and I thought about the world system and I thought about, yeah, but if I, if I, if I go live the life I want to live and I indulge in all these pleasures, I've got to take the world system with it. I'm taking life unto myself. I can no longer count on God for some, my, my security, so I have to count on myself for my security, and that's a joke. I can't really keep myself secure. Have you ever, th- like I, I came across this, show I was watching once and it was about this family and they were all talking about how they were all into karate and the father and the mother and the two daughters and the son that they're, they're all these black belts and they're all into karate and I was like oh this is pretty interesting but then as the show wore on you started to see and it was just an hour so it wasn't like a series you started to see the chinks in their armor you started to see why they were so into karate because they were atheists and because the father actually did love his wife and his daughters and the karate gave them some sense of security that oh my daughters could protect themselves in a parking lot at night maybe I have to be honest with you I'd rather trust in the Lord though (laughs) that he's real he is real and knowing that he's real and he's who he says he is I'd much rather trust in him than hope that my my karate experience is going to keep me or my family safe and and if you're following what I'm saying, I'm just, I gave that as an illustration to say this. The pleasures of this life come part and parcel with the anxieties and worries and cares of this life. They're always together. And they're linked in Scripture more often than you would realize. And those, the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. 
Note that the cares, riches, and pleasures are, are compared to weeds that grow in the soil of our hearts. Verse 15, the fourth type of soil, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> the elephant in the room, to anyone hearing that who lived in an agrarian society, is that good soil didn't exist on its own. And I, and I want you to hear me on this because this is actually the purpose of the parable. The purpose of the parable is not an elevation of the word of God. There are other parables that do that. There are plenty of scriptures that do that. I'm not denigrating the word of God. But what I'm saying is it's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the central issue of the parable. It's not the reason he said it. The elephant in the room, for anyone listening to this who was a farmer or who took part in farming, which is pretty much just about everybody there, was that good soil doesn't exist on its own. Good soil doesn't. Good soil needs fencing and security. That's why all fields have fences around them. Even in this day and age, there were biblical mandates for it. There were, there were stories about it. The fo- little foxes break through the holes in our, in our wall around our garden. Good soil always has fences around it. Secondly, good soil needs tilling. For the same reason God created ants, partly to eat dead things and partly to, to aerate the soil and to uncompact the soil, soil needs tilling. And so we have machines. They had plows pulled by mules that would till up the soil and break it up and make it soft enough and uncompact enough that it could take seeds, that seeds could fall into it, and that their roots could push through it. But soil needs tilling. And thirdly, it needs watering. There's almost nowhere on earth where the water comes at the perfect rate for crops to exist in in a super abundant form that you need for um, farming. Why do I say this? Because the three things I said correlate to the three negative soils. Good soil has fences around it. It's not the wayside. People don't walk across your field because if they walk across your field, they're going to flatten and compact the soil that you just uncompacted. So you build fences around it and you, you, you secure it with scarecrows or with your own presence. You watch over the field to scare away the birds of the air, representative in the parable of, of the devil who comes and steals the seed. It needs tilling to remove the rocks that are there. <clears throat> It needs tilling. Tilling also has a dual purpose of unsettling the weeds that exist there so that they can be removed as well. And it needs watering. Why do I say this? I say this because <clears throat> the truth here is that everyone's heart starts out by the wayside, in the well-worn paths of the world, full of rock patches, hard, unbelieving areas due to pride and selfishness, and entangled in the cares and pleasures of this life. This parable isn't some sort of deterministic tragedy about being born with a certain type of heart condition from which there is no escape. And I mean that. if you, Determinism is the belief that you are a product of your circumstances. There's nothing you could do about your upbringing and about the neighborhood you grew up in, and you are merely a product of your parents, their education, the neighborhood you grew up in. Your life is determined by your circumstances. It's what um, Stephen Hawking believes. He's a determinist. This is not some sort of deterministic tragedy about life that, hey, sorry to break this to you, but you're one of four soils. Hope you're the good one. Have fun. It's not what it's about. That's not what's being said here. The truth is that there is more to salvation than just understanding and receiving the word. Equally important is our need to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit as he he shoes the birds away and leads us away from well-traveled paths and fences in our hearts as he tills up our heart, humbling us and breaking us up as he pulls out the weeds, (coughs) root and all. That is, I believe... The, the main truth that Jesus is conveying here. You remember that I said this, what he shared this when a great multitude began to follow, that he shared this parable. And he, this idea is that it's not just hearing the word. That's basically what he's saying, because these people, that's part of what he's saying, These people 
believed that they would be blessed and they were fulfilling their religious duty by hearing the word. The parable is saying that that's not really the point because you need to deal with your heart. Your religious duty is not fulfilled in just being where you hear the word. Okay, I heard the word. Uh, The seed fell into my life. I'm good. No, you might not be good if you're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're harboring hardness in your heart towards God by refusing to obey him when he says break up with that person or go this route in life or say sorry to this person or honor your parents and do the dishes on a regular basis without being asked, whatever, as he speaks to you, if you're hardening his heart and you're hardening your heart and ignoring him, you are wasting your time hearing, just going to where the word of God is taught because it's just falling off might take root a little bit. You might get kind of excited. You're also wasting your time if, you're, if you come to fellowship, if you come to Bible study and you hear the word of God and it's sown into your life, but your heart spends most of its time in the well-worn, travel, well-trafficked, traveled paths of the world. You're wasting your time because you hear the word of God. The devil comes and steals it away. It is also can be a tremendous waste if you're not allowing the Lord to pull up those deeply rooted weeds in your life, the 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 entanglements, the attachments to the pleasures of this life and the cares of this world. You need to let the Holy Spirit do His work and let go of those things that you need to let go of, so that He can make. And I know that everyone in here, to some degree or another has their heart has you have allowed your heart to be tilled you have allowed your heart to be fenced in to some degree or another but I want to encourage you to continue to let the Lord do that work in your heart <clears throat> Father I thank you for your word I thank you for this time together in it. I pray that everyone here would be blessed through what you've shared Lord I pray that it would take root as as it says that it can do in our lives and that it would affect change in our hearts that we can't even do ourselves. That it would that it would be prosperous and have victory in our lives and bring about change. We love you, Lord, and we lift up the rest of our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.